I'm here with Elf Lions. Yeah, that's she, right. Thank you. So we passed the first <laughs> test. Good. Um, yep. Keep going. Multiple shows in Edinburgh. You've done 12 or 13 shows in Edinburgh at this stage. Oh, I don't know if it's that many. I mean, I'm only 31. <laughs> so, but I mean, I've, I've done my... Uh, we could go through them. We could list them. Chronologically, that's what the viewers Chronologically, want. Chronologically, <laughs> that's what... But you know what? I bet you some people really... I like really get off on telling people like all the stuff I've done in a day. And I find that really, I love it when someone tells me and li- I love people when they make lists. Are you ready for the list that I have in my head then? Yeah, I go, can, go so for it. You went up when you were, so you started comedy, you made the expression that you want to start comedy when you were 16 to your parents. Yeah. And then the next year you went up to Edinburgh as a volunteer yeah. to understand the workings of Edinburgh. Yeah. Based on your dad's advice. Yeah. Where does this all come from? You're very good at this. Or is, 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 oh. just, is, is this just guesswork? Have you done yeah, research? I, 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 of course I've done research. Oh, good. Oh, no, that is very good. You can tell I used to be a teacher. I'm just sort of like, leaning around, okay, tell me more. Tell me about why you want to do this, okay? Uh, then you went to, you, you did go to drama school? I went to Bristol Uni right. to study drama. Okay. Academically. <laughs> and you were doing shows throughout that, but you, you, the first one was Bryden? Yeah, no, what was it? I mean, I'm going to be honest, I always wanted to be a comedian, but I didn't really fit in with the Bristol, <laughs> like, comedy drama. Like, I really, uh, I mean, I think in hindsight, I look at that little person, 18 to 21, and she was just, she was, you know, if I could travel back in time, I'd want to give her a cuddle oh. and wipe all the makeup off. <laughs> and I'd be like, right, we need some proper tights on you. <laughs> this this is <laughs> this is not working. Um, I didn't. I think my first show I didn't do till I was like 2012, 2012 like one out. It's called Elf Lines is a Pervert. <laughs> it was about me. I mean, I'm pretty, yeah, and it was all about me just being a perv, but like in a fun, it was going to be called Feminist Pervert. And then, and then I did a show called Being Barbarella, which was me sort of finding my feet more with my nerdy side. Mm all the nerdy stuff uh and i did a sh- and before the year before that i'd done a show called underground success which was my love of the london underground and obviously i took that to <laughs> scotland where it was really like really relatable um so what's did- your favorite line <laughs> yeah i did that yeah uh, at the time what was my favorite line i always loved the beauty of like the district and the hammersmith and the circle and like how it was owned by different lines and the the sort of history and the economics of the city you could match through the commuter, like who was commuting at different periods of time. I found that really interesting. So I did that. Show. I always made quite specific shows to do with niche things. <laughs> then I did a show about Barbarella, the cartoon and the book, the novel and the book, uh, not the graphic novel and then the, <laughs> the film. And then Pelican, which was about my relationship with my mum. Then Swan, <laughs> which was to do with Swan Lake and ballet. Then Chiff Chaff, which was to do with economics. 2019 was Love Songs to Guinea Pigs, which was all about my spinal injury and my obsession with guinea pigs. Then 2020, I did Gorgon, <laughs> a horror story. I mean, there's a, a I mean, in hindsight. I think we're up to I'm, 12. I mean, yeah, no. And then that doesn't even count all the stuff that I helped do. I did, <laughs> I did loads of other stuff as well. Um, God, that's insane. And then, and then I did Gorgon. Then I did, I did Medusa as well in 2019 for the Nuffield Theatre, but that wasn't a fringe. I'm, I've always made live work, mm. basically. I just like, I like work. I like making shows. I've done loads of random stuff in between here and there. And I think the there. introduction was like, I think we got there. I think yeah. we've been introduced. Oh, you also do the podcast with your, your dad? I do Alphanomics, yeah, yeah, with my dad. I, I am excited to talk about it. I also got the fear to talk about the podcast because I did intro- introduction to microeconomics mm-hmm. in university. Oh, did you? I'm starting to shake thinking about it. I did not do well, so you can fill in the gaps on that one. Oh, God. <laughs> See how that goes. <laughs> so let's bring it the whole way back. You st- was the first time you thought about comedy when you said you wanted to be a comedian? Yeah, I, I, I was obsessed with DVDs, with comedy DVDs. And I used to, at Christmas, I remember writing a list of all the DVDs. And I'd go to <laughs> Choices Film Store and rent them and just watch them and I remember like watching Joe Pasquale and like Lee Everett like watching the most bizarre you know that French and Saunders and all that stuff I realized it stood out more as opposed to saying an actor mm. it was more I also because I went to an all-girls school it was probably quite provocative in some ways I remember teachers thinking it was really bizarre that that was what I especially my upbringing like I went to a very you know 
prolific, hard-working boarding school where, you mm. know, you were treated like a dressage horse to jump through hoops mm. and, you know, this expectation that you were all going to become CEOs and, you know, founders of the new world, <laughs> you know, you too can run your own business and, and sell it for millions of pounds. And then I was like, I want to be in comedian, <laughs> which everyone was like, you don't make any money from that. Um, I can't. But it took me ages. I le I loved be. I loved funny people, mm. but I didn't know how to be. I think there's a you know when you're a kid, you're unintentionally funny, mm. and that's often what par parents and adults love about you, especially the kids. And I'm sure we all know that like teenager or that ten year old kid who makes everyone laugh, and they're not aware of what makes them funny, but they're a funny kid. Mm. I think I was a bit like that, and then going to university and stuff, I really felt so displaced. Like I didn't really, like I, did, I wasn't funny. I wasn't in the funny crowd. I wasn't cool. Like I wasn't one of those people at all. Was there like, a funny crowd in your university? Oh yeah. Well, my university, like, you know, it was pretty, our university, all the people who came out of Bristol who went on to make comedy have all gone to do incredibly well. Mm. Like the alumni from my year and the year above is like astoundingly like, our years smashed it. In terms of, like, <laughs> everyone who everyone had their interest in, you know, directors, cinematographers, you know, mm. writers, etc. You know, it was funny. You go, oh, bloody hell, that's cool. <laughs> wow. Um, but I wasn't really, it took me a while to sort of, I think, embed myself in doing the weird. And you mm. realise you're not in that cool, that lovely thing. I always say this when I was teaching my students, like the coolest place is where you are, mm. said when I taught like drama club. And you get all the cool, eccentric, weird kids, like all the weird kids. The misfits. And I'm like, this is this is the coolest place in the school right now, is where we are. And the kids <laughs> are like, yeah, miss. <laughs> yeah, that's very, that's actually very nice. Uh, that's very good. And then when did you do your first stand-up comedy performance? Um, 16th of October, <laughs> 2008. Wow. Yeah, I was 16, yeah, 16. Where was that? Downstairs at the King's Head. Oh, John Kearns was on the bill as well. He was reading from the Penguin Packets, reading <laughs> jokes. And on Biswas, there was lots of comics, actually. Funnily enough, and I, I lasted, I think, two minutes. I was so nervous. I didn't know what I was doing. But you, I think you need to spend those first 100 gigs learning how to breathe. Mm. Just being breath work. Learning how to just sit in it. I only learned what my diaphragm was like two years ago, so <laughs> <laughs> I need to, need to yeah, work it out. So were you nervous? You were nervous before. Were you throwing up already at this stage? Is that still a thing that happens? Oh, God, I still, I get a temperature every time I go to do a comedy gig. Like before a big, no, that's not true. Like before a one hour show, I'll, mm. I'll always get like this. God, I, I don't think I can, I actually don't think I can do this. <laughs> I, I'm going to, I'm going to have to pull it. And then. And then you're like, oh, no, no, it's fine. <laughs> Home now. <laughs> and do you remember what the material was for the first gig? Did uh, you have material? It was to do with me being, you know, ugly and couldn't get a boyfriend. And, like, the routine that very much was encouraged on all girls of a certain age when you went into comedy. Like, you're a woman of this age where you've got to talk about how difficult it is to find a boyfriend. And, you know, and you've got to make a joke about this and this and this. I don't think it was hugely... I've, I've kept all my... Di diaries of all my comedy material and it's really funny looking back on some of it and going I can make that funny now that was never going to be funny mm. that's too sad that's really funny ah there's something yeah you know analyzing because also your brain keeps changing yeah it must have been it. so plastic at that stage yeah well. it was like it's like a little you know it's really sweet <laughs> Like it's really sweet. And some of the stuff is also also because, you know, our understanding of things has changed so much. You you know, I was chatting to another comic about this, about jokes that were at, like our understandings about gender identity were really different. And going, wow, that joke is, that joke couldn't exist now. Not because it's offensive or anything, but just that world doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't believe that joke. Or like, and that moment of, I think being a, later in my early 20s and realising jokes about me not being able to get a boyfriend didn't work anymore mm. because it wasn't true because I was confident, mm. like I'd found myself in some sort of way. I was mm. a bit more embedded. And so me coming on and being like, 
oh yeah, I'm a bit insecure about this, this and this. The audience didn't quite, it didn't land. Mm. So I was like, how else can I be truthful? That's very, very profound. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I love your laugh. uh, It's wild, isn't it? It I love it. It's uh, great. Let's go. I've had a few comments on the... I can't stop it, and I'm having a good time, Elle, so unfortunately... Good, you I'll... should never stop it. You should never <laughs> censor who you are. But uh, 16, to start comedy is amazing. Yeah, but... I mean, 16 to start comedy if you were gigging regularly, but I mean, like, I did, what, a couple of gigs? Like, it wasn't... It wasn't enough. Like, it was... I tested the... F- I. Mm. It's a really cool thing to have done at age 16, mm. for sure, and it was really cool that my dad drove me there. And sat in the audience and then gave me feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Can you describe your dad just for context? Um, he's really, when you listen to him talk, he's got a really calm, soft demeanor. He's very warm. He's got a real like Winnie the Pooh vibe, I would <laughs> say. And he's also like incredibly passionate about economics. Mm. And very like, he's like me, we're very high high achieving we want to do it to the best and we both get fixated on specific things Mm. and if we're interested in that thing we really only focus on that thing and then everything else sort of goes out the window (laughs) that's why we go on that's very cool i I listened to another interview with you uh the Stuart goldstein one and you were talking about how in your family they were very supportive of comedy which is maybe not like normal yeah but they were like you have to commit there's no half measures or obviously i'm paraphrasing what i think you said oh yeah yeah and my dad and I talk about this in our recent podcast. We did an, ex- an, an episode on alphanomics about what artists can learn from football mm. and the football model. Um, but when I was a kid, my oh, I remember when I was a kid, when I was like teens and early twenties, and I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to be a comedian. And but at the same time, I was like, "Well, Dad, I'm going to do this as well. And I'm going to do this." And I'd always I was trying to stick my finger into so many pies. Mm. And my dad said, "If you want to do this, you do it." And you focus on it. Like you get your 10,000 hours in. Mm. David Beckham became the best footballer of his, you know, in his lifetime Mm. because he practiced his right foot and he practiced his left foot. Mm. That's what he did. He didn't decide to practice cricket as well. He didn't go, you know what, I'm going to do swimming and perfect my swimming ability. Like, yeah, you get strong in all areas, but you focus. What do you want to do? Mm. You don't, don't waste your energy doing stuff that isn't necessarily going to benefit whatever that goal is. Hmm. So that I found really useful. I love that David Beckham story, by the way. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think that's a great story where he's outside doing keepy uppies and stuff. It's it's so good. And like, and also I was really like my dad. And again, he always said, and my mum said this as well, you can have three careers in your lifetime. Hmm. Our generation will have three careers. Hmm. You don't just pick one thing and then that's it till you die. And like my dad's generation hit the generation before him. So that understanding that you have the time to become an expert. And we like, my sister was a horse rider, like a professional horse rider for a period of time. Um, and one thing I learned, and I hated horse. I hate horses. <laughs> I fucking hate horses. I'm really scared of them as well. So yeah, we like, were preaching I'm not to the scared choir. of them. I'm just allergic. And I just <laughs> don't have the time. Like, I just... I love them, but I'm like, I don't want to sit on your back. But like, I just... <laughs> Probably doesn't want that either, to yeah. be fair. <laughs> just do your thing. Um, but I would have to spend so many of my summer holidays at horse fairs and, like, farmyard festivals and what going to, like, horse, you know, horse competitions. And on all the horse riders, the best horse riders, and especially if you go to the Olympics and watch mm. the Olympics or watch the Olympic dressage and cross country, they're not young. Horse riders are older mm. because it takes ages to learn an animal to be an expert of being to be the expert with this craft Mm. and it's the same with comedy it's not it's a young person's game in terms of getting into it and at the beginning just failing and failing and failing like that's fun you could do that in your 20s that you can Mm. do that you can go out and get smashed every night and but to be a master of it it takes it's going to take years so i like that like i'm at i'm 31 and i feel very embedded in who I am as a mm. comic but it's going to take it's you know I'm going to be even more brilliant when I'm 50 mm. and hopefully if my brain keeps firing even better at 64 
Mm. Yeah, it's very positive and like exciting way to look at it. <laughs> Let me find but, out next year I get diagnosed with dementia. <laughs> I'm like, oh dear. This at least is we'll my have peak. this to memorize. <laughs> you smash in this one. Uh, but you, st- but you, I remember watching a YouTube video and you were like actively doing a lot of gigs. You were running a night in this YouTube video. Oh, which one was this? Um, God. You were in a night. It looked like a very fun night. Oh, Secret Comedians, yeah. London Live. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was so... God, the, you know what? The acts that have come through that night as well, like mm. some of the lineups we would have, like one night where it was like Alex Edelman, Lou Sanders, me, um, Eric Lamper, you know, just really cool <laughs> Rosie Holt doing a spot, Joz Norris, like really cool lineups of yeah. just really, what you know, the story beast. <laughs> and it was just the first Thursday of the month or something. Or well, last Wednesday, it was, you know, one of those things. And it was always raucous and fun. I remember one night, the band, the 1975, who I had no <laughs> idea. But they were just sat at the bar watching. And I had no idea, but they were like these good looking blokes. And someone was like, that's the 1975. And I was like, who? <laughs> I don't know. Do they want a five? <laughs> you know, like really bizarre you know, fun lineups. Mm. And you decided just to run that to get, what was, why were you doing that? Just for fun? More stage well, time? For fun, to become better at understanding the art of comedy, you know, mm. it was a cool thing to run a gig. It was very different. I would run a gig again, potentially, but it would be finding the right space and how you do it. Mm. So you went from a few gigs when you were 17 then. When did you start to get more like, I need to gig all the time with comedy or did you ever? Um, once I did my master's, mm. when I did my master's, I think, around because I was based in London then. Mm. And I was living with my nan, Nanny Squeak, in South London, in Eltham. And it was just easier to commute and get from gigs to gigs. Mm. And and I was running a gig. I ran a comedy night at the Bow Bells in East London, Bow, Bow Bells Comedy, which Jade Adams designed the poster for, <laughs> for 20 quid. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> All these funny little like overlaps. So did you finish the masters and you were like not as into what where were you when the masters was finished? Um like I also worry that I'm talking too much. Well, it's this... all about you. Don't worry, I have nothing. I okay. Have, I'll I'll try to be a funny Northern Irish quip <laughs> occasionally, but I'm just trying to find out about you. So don't worry about that. This is interesting. Cool. Okay. I think I I get really I hate do you know it's that horrible thing when you listen back to yourself doing a podcast. I am um, it was really fascinating, actually. Someone asked for some clips of me doing a podcast mm. for me to sort of, you know, when you pitch yourself forward for things and whatever. Or oh, particular ep- particular series were like, we need to hear Elf on a couple of podcast episodes to see what she normally talks about. So I cut, selected a random a, a, a array of things. And there was one podcast episode I hadn't heard since 2019. But I remember when it came out, they were like, this is a great episode. It's really, really funny. Da, 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 da. And I listened to it. 2019, and in hindsight, I was I was really suffering with post-traumatic stress after my spinal injury. And I hadn't been particularly well. And there'd been lots of stuff going on that year. And that recording, and I remember being, but I was listening to it going, I sound mean. Like I sound, I wasn't mean to anyone in particular. Like the, the podcast episode was about me being nasty about, you know, these things. It's called Desert Island Dicks. It's a great podcast <laughs> series, but it's about who would you want to die on a plane with you? Mm. Or like, who would you not want? Who would be going down in this plane? Mm. And I like selected the whole of Surbiton. <laughs> and it was really based off particular like things that had happened that week. And it was so fascinating because I was listening to you soften. It's only been about four years, but I listen and I go, wow, I sound really barbed and and sharp and quite I was like oh that doesn't feel like me I'm listening mm. to and so I always am aware when you're when you listen back sometimes especially when you give it a few months you're like god I sound god I'm self-involved or god I think I'm smarter than I am or goodness you absolutely no, think... no but it's, it's funny isn't it because yeah. you're constantly I suppose that's the learning I guess yeah learning also I think it's the horrible thing about being the risk with this job or the moment you decide that your job is you you, and you are your brand Mm. is there's a huge amount of self-analysis which Mm. can be really fascinating and illuminating but it can also encourage a really nasty form it can a a quite damaging form of narcissism Mm. and you have to go you know what i have to step away and set and 
you aren't the most fascinating creature of the world at all. So let's just, <laughs> does that? <laughs> well, I feel like a psycho then because I've been researching your life for the last few days. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry to feed the, the narcissism. I don't feel like, I don't get any narcissistic vibes off you at all. I'm also a terrible judge of character. So well, you know what I mean? Sometimes you yeah, just, I you, but I think it's good. To, I don't think I am. Mm. But I think it's important to be like my biggest fear when I talk to my therapist is like, I'm worried I'm a narcissist. <laughs> and she's like, we've gone through this actually quite a few times. So if you're, <laughs> you're worrying about, the, and I'm like, I came in the other day and I was like, I think I'm, I think I might be a psychopath. And she was like, why? And I was like, well, and I explained the thing to her and she was just like, I, if anything, that's definitely not psychopathic <laughs> behavior. That just sounds quite practical. And I was like, oh, okay, right, good. <laughs> well, welcome back to the Elf Lions, a comedy success podcast. <laughs> Well, no, I, that, I think that's probably like the best defense mechanism is being aware of it. Like, I think yeah. it would be much more unhealthy to be like me. No, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. Whereas you're like being self uh, like critical and. Yeah, it was uh, Benji Waterstone, who's a fantastic, a, a beautiful human being. And I taught him, he did the Soho Labs Comedy Plus course, which I taught last term. And he was. Um, I really, you could tell also I did a master's because anytime I mention someone, I have to mention their name and when I met them. <laughs> and like, it's like full, like, it's Fair like, it, it is like a footnote. <laughs> it's me and my dad both do it and it's really funny. And it's just like, you want to make sure that the facts are really clear. But we were working together and he's taking a show to Edinburgh um, about his job as an N NHS psychiatrist and really fascinating, really provocative. And it's based off a book he's just about to publish. And we're talking about what it means to exist, you know, really deep as it always is when you're working with another comic and developing work. And I've been reading loads about humanism and because it's just really fascinating. And this idea of what it means when people say they're trying to be happy, like, what does that mean? But mm. you want to find meaning in your life and do something that causes joy to others. And that's sort of how I try and live. But talking about the plastic bag and it hit me like a plastic bag takes 1000 years to decay mm. and that's going to outlive me my grandchildren our grandchildren's grandchildren and we just like in a second we just pay 5p for something like that and we carry mm. them all around our house there are things that are going to last longer than our own skin and bones mm. buried in the ground and i find that really and I, I, it was actually really freeing because there is that thing even though you know that you're doing okay and you're only doing what you can and then you get told, oh, yeah, you haven't been asked or accepted onto this. Or, or you have, and you're like, suddenly you're the big, big, <laughs> big, big balls. <laughs> Just looking at that plastic bag and going, oh, yeah. It's going to win. And it's also like with money. I find like money is such a big thing. Um, and, you know, Rosie Holt said this, um, who's a really brilliant human being, but she told me once, I was really, she went, Elf, you've had to pay the incompetence tax, which <laughs> I really loved because I'd lost my rail card and it meant I had to pay a fine and an extra fee on a train ticket. And I was just like, Ugh. <laughs> she was like, you had to pay the incompetence tax and it, you don't know when you're going to get have to pay it but you have to pay the incompetence tax sometimes. And that I found that a really much more manageable way of dealing with that experience by going, this is something outside of my control, by the gods. Um, what's it talking about? Stoicism and plastic bags, I think. Is yeah. what, is but um, <laughs> then I think about money going, I just don't, I've not seen money in such, like it's in my account or it's out of my account or mm. I tap and it's dis... But I never, it's never there. Like, <laughs> I don't... I just find it really hard to get when someone's like, oh, I didn't get the job and I've lost down 12 grand or whatever it is. And I'm like, you know, for an advert or something. I mean, I'm always stressed about money, as is everyone. But like, I'm like, well, you have it and then you don't have it. But like all the time I'm looking at the plastic bag going, nobody's going to, it's arguably better to die in debt than it is to die in profit based on how much of a fuck over it causes everyone else afterwards. That's the way to go. Yeah. Just massive overdrafts. Yeah. There's the economic theory. <laughs> I'm going to have a plastic bag in my room. I think that that's going to put on a wall. It'll be the only piece of art I have. Yeah. Yeah. I feel really under... Um, under prepare because I am not in any way artsy. I don't identify as artsy. And my first play was the wonderful play on the weekend. I'm gonna butcher the name, Misandrist. No, you said it perfectly. By the wonderful Lisa Carroll. Yeah, Lisa she Carroll. Wrote it. Yeah, she did write it. She's incredible. And you were amazing in it. Thank you. I have only seen one play, so you are technically 
my favorite play. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it's like really that you've never seen a play. Um, before? I've seen lots of musical theater. Well, that's so more like, commercial, yeah. I guess. But you no, no, but it's still the same. It's all like it's a different style, but it's still like it's theater and it's a play, mm. but it's got music in it. And... But I really thought I would need the constant songs to keep, like maintain my focus because I went in. I guess it was just being like, oh, stand up comedies. <laughs> Stand-up comedy is the, the thing. They're not going to make me laugh. And then I had way more fun at that show than I have at any comedy show. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And that I've, really means a lot that you came to see it. Oh, of course. I, was I so think, excited. yeah, it's a really, it's really fascinating. Like I do, and it's so, such an honor to be, and that sounds really wanky, but I've never done, a, I've never acted in a play, like I've never acted in something that, and this sounds even more wanky, that I haven't made myself because mm. there's, you know, that's always the smartest way to do it. Mm. I think if anyone make it, do it, put it on, fund it yourself, just do it on your Thank terms. Thank you so much for saying that. That is my big belief as well, the ownership sort of thing, because I think a lot of people are waiting for permission. No, do it. You do it yourself. Do, do it yourself. Um, I think the new gener like Generation Z are much better at it, mm -hmm. of that sense of self-made getting on it, because suddenly they all, technologically, they're all much more fluent and mm -hmm. having access to sharing their world and their voice in a way that I think our generation, the generations before, weren't. Mm -hmm. And that was why you said a bigger class divide in many ways, because certain people had access to having their voice and others mm -hmm. didn't. I wonder, I don't know what the what the studies show, what the data is, but... You, whatever you said is now my new study and my data. My data? I don't know how we say data, it. No, data, data. Oh, there you go. You've got a Northern Irish accent. Data. You, you said you didn't have I, it. I need to try. I, <laughs> can't, I can't do it. So why did you end up, why Why did you agree to be an actor I in got, that one? I got cast. Mm. They asked me for, to audition and I auditioned and it was just really, and I just left teaching, secondary school teaching, so... Mm. I was really, I had no idea what was going to happen. I had that fear that nothing was going to happen. It would have been the biggest regret to leave teaching. And then, and then it happened. It was really frightening. And I mean, I cried loads throughout the rehearsal process because I would have imposter syndrome. But then you remind yourself imposter syndrome is just you being a stranger to something. Mm. It's not you being, it's not you breaking into a house that you don't belong in. It's just you walking into a, being invited into a space mm. where you don't know anyone yet. And it's up to you and other people to, you know I'm not quite sure how to say it but yeah it's just you're learning something so allow yourself to be honest with people that you're learning and that you're going to make mistakes and I think the play is really provocative and I think it's a play that in 10-15 years time will be really celebrated and mm -hmm. will be quite cult I really do believe that and it's fascinating how it has split people down the middle in our audiences mm -hmm. so far and yeah. it's brought out a different side of conservative behavior from audience members that you would assume wouldn't be conservative, but are, because we're so much more accepting of violence than sex on stage. Mm -hmm. Like, so like in the misandrist, we don't kiss, actually. We never kiss throughout the play. We have our clothes on the entire time. We don't actually touch, mm -hmm. like have physical touch in that way. Um, the sex is performed in like an abstract, like through dance music and mm. dancing. Um, but people said that it was explicit. People described it as like, you know, not for children and obviously not for, you know, obviously not for children, but as if we were literally simulating kind of lingus and mm. doing those things on stage was mm. how it was sort of reviewed. Um, and it was so interesting. A play to do which explores sexual behavior sexual pleasure and also mm. coercion and also what happens when the female dominates the sexual you know the sexual relationship it it was so like the best way to describe it is if a woman's raped on stage in a play we often go wow that's really serious that's intense or a play you know you can watch i think it's lavinia and titus andronicus get her tongue ripped out her hands cut off and gang raped and we go wow that was one of shakespeare's f shock most shocking comedies mm. you can watch you know titania get drugged to sleep and wake up with and fall in love with an ass and we're like oh that's so funny oh we can watch you know amelia get stabbed to death and Des desdemona strangled by her husband and mm. we call it serious art but you watch a woman experience sexual pleasure on stage and we go oh it's just a bit crass isn't it it's such a shame it just felt a bit oh it was a bit rude wasn't it oh it was unnecessary wasn't it a bit cringe and it's like wow we're so used to watching female pain but sex and pleasure is still really uncomfortable to us mm -hmm. um and i think that's what's so cool about it is and i like 
how you see people get shocked without them realizing why they're uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the play is funny, the acting is great, the set design, lighting design, it's all a beautifully put together production. Mm -hmm. So it's the content that is what makes people feel displaced, Mm -hmm. which I really, that I find interesting. Well, I think you you nailed it when you said in like 15 years it's going to have a, it's going to become a cult because I was there being like, I'm so happy I'm watching this in the, like in this early like phase of it, obviously. Yeah. I was like, well, this is very cool. Especially if I've just knocked it out of the park. That's the first play I've watched. I don't need to watch anything else now. You know what I mean? So I thought it was good. <laughs> no, you said it beautifully because even for me, I did, it's the first time I'd seen anything like it. I didn't have any sort of context of all plays where like the language is really accessible, really like. Um, I don't know, so humorous just from all the ref, obviously mm-hmm. very London based, but I just, I, I don't even know how to express how much I really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, I've never seen anything like that either. So uniqueness is a big thing as well. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I mean, I'm really touched you came to see it. No, what did you think of the monologue at the end? Yeah, I agree with that. And then the monologue leads to like all the issues with men. Mm-hmm. And I agree with basically all of them, but mm-hmm. I, I didn't know how to, I don't have the emotional capacity to process like what I should do about it. So I just, I could just clap, but I was like, oh, fuck. It was very eye opening, but I don't know what to do. But I sometimes to I think that's apology. it. But what, you know, but that's the point is when he apologizes on behalf of all men and she's like, oh, thank you. It's yeah. like, we, it's not really what people want. We, yeah. not, it's not what women want. They want, they want just people to accept and be aware and listen. Mm. That's the key thing. To listen to what it's really interesting. So the monologue is like, I hate men. Yeah. I do. I hate how basic they are. I hate how, and it lists, and then it's less, and it starts as I hate all men, but mm. then it turns into specific actions. And anyone who actually listens to the monologue will realize that, she, yes, she thinks she hates men, but she doesn't. She hates these people who, quite rightly, have absolutely broken her. Yeah. And you know the thing she's saying. I don't think anyone would disagree with. You know, I hate men who use their power to coerce women into sex. I hate men who will date someone else's teenage daughter. But yet you see men and it's so fun doing that monologue because it's 10 minutes long as well. It's a really, there's 144 I hates that she says. My only complaint was I disconnected slightly because I was like, how is Elf doing this? (laughs) It's it's insane. I was like, what is going on? Do you know what's really funny? So to learn that monologue... um, I recorded it on GarageBand and then added a dubstep nice. beat that I found on <laughs> YouTube. And they'd be like, I hate men. I can't do music. And I would play it in the gym whilst I was exercising. So, yeah. But then I went into the sauna and didn't connect my Bluetooth speakers properly. <laughs> Press play. It just, my voice started shouting out, I hate men. And everyone must have thought, God, this crazy woman in this sauna with all these men. It's just like listening to this sort of, you know, piece of propaganda, <laughs> misandrist <laughs> propaganda. No, I think it tackles it really well and brings it to the point where, like, you've seen the journey. So the meal, meals will hopefully have, I don't know, I'm just so problematic, Elf. I'm not trying to be. I'm just so. I don't know, what do you mean problematic? Because I think it, it, would, it takes me the whole show to get to the situation where I'm not going to be defensive about it. And, you know, because I feel like I really, I agree with all the messaging. But if someone would say that to me without, if someone just comes to me and approaches me and starts listing that, I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. You know? oh, so it's not really fair for someone to do that to you, but also anyone who I think the moment you put the moment you say any group, yeah, like, as I whole. hate children, I hate men, I yeah. hate women, I hate this. Like it's like I don't like I hate in comedy when people like they make a joke like, at the expense of all white men mm. or something like that. Because I'm just like really like I get it, I understand the sort of punching up. But then, like, you know, you look at statistics of, like, suicide in the UK mm. and, like, some of the poorest groups, like, regional areas in the south and northeast and, like, lots of – it's it's more co- – it, everyone knows this. It's complex. Mm. So why use stereotypes? Why ever – why do we use that stereotype mm. in that way? I, I just don't think it's helpful because it creates a bigger disparity and it creates more people to get more defensive and it creates, again, more binaries, which I don't think are 
useful and also crucially they're not as smart as you think they are Mm. like it's like when anyone I don't really like it in comedy when people make a joke about like all Labour voters or all Conservatives or all this because I'm like it's not the funniest joke you can make mm. like that re- at the end of the day it's not the funniest joke you mm. can make it's not the smartest joke you can make mm. it's quick and it's efficient and sometimes that is what you need as an MC at certain points but is that really what you want your art to be mm. beautifully it's, said yeah um but then I might say that and people will go, well, that just means you're this, this. And you're like, no, it doesn't mean anything. It's just, I don't know, 10 years of watching comedy now. Mm. I can. It's the fun thing of watching comedy and going, I can see what the punchline's going to be. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, you're so deep into comedy now that like that you have these revelations. <laughs> no, so I, I have a feeling of that, but mm-hmm. I don't know how to express it. So <laughs> thank you for, for, for awarding it. Yeah, it takes yeah. ages to do it. Yeah, I I'll maybe have like, a tiny pinch of something of something I don't like. I don't know why. I'll be like, oh, something in my subconscious doesn't like what someone's done or what I've done. Mm-hmm. And then I just keep doing it repeatedly. <laughs> so thank you for telling us. Um, <laughs> so when you were in, when you did the drama degree, yeah. were you torn between being an actor or comedian or were they always the same sort of I had thing? no idea. <laughs> like, at one point I wanted to be a director. I did lighting design for a while. I wanted to be a lighting designer. Mm. I, then I also, after my MA, I was like, maybe be a live artist you know what actually i like i loved admin like i worked at, <laughs> I worked at arts at the old fire station in their contracting department like and i would commute there from i did set building and ealing like i was the general manager of the finbra theater for a bit like wow. i did crazy i did a huge variety of different jobs and then i was like maybe i'll do a phd and become an academic because that's cool that's like really <laughs> cool that would be amazing um I really had no idea. I was sort of lost. And I think it was also that fear thing of going, I don't think I can do it. Hmm. I'd rather, and, there, and I think the reason I wanted to do a PhD was part of me at that time. It was if I did that, and it would be more, not more possible, but get me out of saying, oh, you know, I didn't make it as a comic. Hmm. But I think it was good to, I'm glad I ended up, so I was very, I applied to do the ideas. This was when Vault Festival just started. And I got the Ideas Tap Award mm. to do my show, Barbarella, at Vault. And then I crowdfunded £700 to go to Adelaide to do the Adelaide Fringe mm. for a month. And that was really where everything switched on its head. And that was 2015, 2015, 2014, because I went and I met Doc Brown and he was doing a clowning course. Phil Burgess and he said you should go to Gollier I was like what's that and he went this actor Helen Duff he was pointing at Lucy Hopkins he was pointing at all these amazing artists at the fringe that year and he went they all went to Gollier and he went and you could be that type of artist you've got it in you to you you're weird you've got that sort of way of thinking and I thought I've got nothing to lose and so I emailed whilst I was there and I got accepted to go and then I shit <laughs> David Mills is a really brilliant comedian. He's just fantastic. He ran a, he did a, a jewellery company and did like loads. He did, And he needed a flyer for this jewellery <laughs> festival. So when I came out to London, and I was working as a ping pong girl at this club called Bounce with lots of other comedians as well, like Luke McQueen and like <laughs> Joey Page. And, like really funny group. And, um, and then I would to teach ping pong for an hour to like city boys and like you know or not we'll just like you shift out the day and then i'd go and fly for this jewelry festival <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a silly time and then mm. went to Gollier, and that in that period of time that was sort of when i got signed f- for the first time as and that felt like a big deal mm. and in hindsight i'm like you know you realize you know you always had the ability to make it work but i think there's so much pressure to be signed mm. and actually i don't really think I think it's obviously really cool because you need someone who understands contracts. But I think, you know, you were always an artist. You didn't need anyone else to tell you you were. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I went to Gollier and that sort of really changed everything. And Gollier, you didn't do the clown in there? You did the drama? I, I did everything except everything. clowning, okay. funnily enough. Can you tell us what that means? Because I'm so excited. I've heard about this and I was just like, that's so cool. I so, yeah. le, le jeu. Um, Play or something? Yeah, it? The, the game. Um, Molière, a mask, um, neutral mask, Greek tragedy, Buffon, 
characters. Shakespeare and Chekhov. What was there was another one, Vaudeville. I actually no, I didn't do Vaudeville. I didn't do Vaudeville. I I did a little bit during Shakespeare and Chekhov, but yeah. And You're there for the whole year and you did two, the two I did years? a year and I so I did the whole first year and then I did came back for Buffon, which was one whole term. So mm. I didn't do vaudeville and I didn't do clown because I had to work in the back in the UK. Um, and now it's only a one year course. And when mm. I went, Philippe taught four days of the week where I believe now he only teaches three. Mm. And now it's only one year as opposed to two. And there's a summer intensive course as and well. There's a summer the, intensive course. The light, the light work, work. But I was like, I need to go. I don't know why I seen your play and I was like, told my girlfriend, I was like, I need to go to the clowning thing. Well, go and do it, especially <laughs> because he's going to, he will retire yeah. very soon. Like, <laughs> But I have no place saying that. I, this is the problem with my brain is I'll be inspired by something. And, and unfortunately, I will actually go and do it. I wish there was a barrier where I would stop, but I will. I'm well, not an actor. Well, if you want to go and learn clowning, so like obviously, but should a, should a comedian do it? I think everybody should. Like, I think it's really you know because also what's the you know you're there to learn. You're also there to learn what you like and what you don't like. Everyone mm. has the right to learn. Everyone has the right to, you know, somebody you know, you do Greek theatre, <laughs> you know, just you know what uh, that thing of why are you doing it can sometimes mm. be really why wouldn't you do it? Mm. I think it's more interesting. And if it's just because, well, I don't feel like I should, then that's not enough of a reason. You might be the most dangerous person I can speak to because I will fully now go. So thank you, Elf. I can't look forward to my but summer like, There's loads of like <laughs> Carla Giacucci who taught the movement there at Gollier. He does clown courses. Mm. He's fantastic. So Vigo Van obviously is uh, who. Congratulations, me, Vigo, yeah. on his win yesterday. It's so funny. It's so Gollier. Me, um, John Luke Roberts, who's a brilliant comedian. Um, a lovely um, artist called Oliver and Vigo and I all lived together. And Vigo lived in the kitchen with his partner, <laughs> Julia Masley. And we come into the kitchen and they had this little area cornered off. And I just hear Julia go, hi, Elf. <laughs> like her beautiful voice. And I'm like, hi, Julia. Um, but, you know, these funny memories. And the building used to rock when the trains would come past. Um, uh, like, you know... Uh, Lucy Hopkins does amazing clown courses. She's a phenomenal artist. Dan Lees, who run, who does the establishment, runs the London Clown Festival. He does courses. He's great. Julia Masley runs courses. I, I do, obviously. Um, there's lots of really fantastic clown practitioners. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Spy Monkey, I think, and John Davison's book on clowning is really interesting, and he runs great clown courses. I think... The obsession with Gollier now is interesting because people suddenly realised, oh, mm. but it was always there. Mm. Um, but there are also other places mm. and there are new styles that are coming through because, you know, there are different methodologies and very mm. different ideas of what clowning is. Um, yeah, so I do think for anyone interested in it, don't just sign up to go there. Mm. You know, there, you can obviously, but think of other places. And also... Don't say that you tra you. Some people are like, I trained, I trained out, <laughs> I worked with, and you're like, you did one week. Like, come What's on, the, did, why you, would I go elsewhere? You oh. did a holiday. <laughs> I want to call myself an actor. <laughs> it's like someone going, I went to Rada, and you're like, you did the weekend <laughs> course. Jeez, oh, I would be so on. obnoxious after going for two weeks, and just I would be like, oh, you're climbing in, yes, so I, well, go to the course. No, I wouldn't obviously, mm -hmm. but that's very good. <laughs> I will check it. But do you think there's value then in people trying to pursue stand up to do climbing as well? There's value in whatever you do as long as you do it with good intentions and mm. and it makes you happy and you're doing it for healthy reasons. Mm. Like if it's an inquisitiveness and a genuine question towards who you are and what you want to do, then great, do it. Mm. But if it's to tick a box, you think it's the gateway to you becoming successful, then maybe you're not going to be... And, you know, I've seen people who do it because they want to be a clown and not just a clown. They want to emulate this particular artist. Mm. No, you're not going to – you don't know what – the amount of times, like, directing and working with artists who clearly want to be someone else and mm. you can't be someone else. Mm. You can't. It's why in comedy – it was one cool thing Philippe always said. Well, it was just, you know, you've got to be aware of who you are. You've got to be aware of what you look like. You've got to be aware of what you sound like. You've got to be aware of all these things because the audience are, and the, you can't lie to an audience. Mm. I mean, you can, like, in a lot of comedians, some, not a lot, 
like some comedians do. They lie about where they're from, their background, their voice. And yeah, you don't necessarily owe it to the audience for them to know everything, but mm. they can see through when you're being inauthentic. Mm. Um, and my dad always said to me, my dad was, you know, because my dad was Irish working class, by you know, went in, did well in economics and, you know, because of various factors and my, you know, I would, I went to a boarding school because mm. it was the best school for me and my learning needs and what was going on in my life at that time, age 10, 11. My dad said, don't mention it on stage because people won't like you. And he's true. But the difference is, is I'm 31 now and I don't, I don't care I, if you're going to make a judgment based on that one thing. Mm. Absolutely fair enough. But we're more than just one component. And I'd much rather be totally honest about my background, my family, everything, than come on stage and feel the need to lie because the audience don't have time for that, and neither mm. do I. Like, and if you're going to judge me, then you're always going to judge me. Like, I don't, I don't need yeah. that. You won't come to my show again. Fair enough. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. What a boss attitude. I like it. That's so. That's so... <laughs> well, it's just I get annoyed when people pretend. I get. I just find it really disingenuous, and the industry is already so flawed in so many ways. Mm. Like we don't need to, don't need to make it more dishonest than it already is. Come on, mm. just just say say what's going on. <laughs> no, going. nobody's gonna hate you. Yeah, and if they are, then they've got their own stuff. They're always gonna hate. Mm. Most people don't want to hate other people. Most people don't want to be angry at other people. <laughs> yeah, very true. Very true. No, that's amazing, Elf. Um, I'm just trying to think. Of so many lessons. I'm like, oh, you're super fine and wise. Oh and my you're god, like, you're gonna put this out, and so many people are like, I'm gonna. Ha I hate this posh bitch. <laughs> Who does she think she is? I hate her. Ugh. Her point. I don't think she's very funny. I saw her play. No, 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 no. Clown school. No, Get you have life. some soup. You have like some of the best stand up I've seen with the the. It was such a weird video to watch because I couldn't find many like the videos maybe, but I don't put many. Yeah, videos. that's. I'm putting my special up on Talk Dirty next week on my YouTube channel. Nice. And it's the and it's going to be. It's just talks dirty for now. It's just an hour straight stand up. It's not mm. necessarily got any great vibe. It's mostly improvised as well. <laughs> but, so but, wait, please tell me how you how, how does that happen? Quite ten years. Oh no, I know. No, I'm not saying like how, how, how do you have the talent? No, I'm not saying that. I'm being like Sorry, how, how do you, you can have edit the... that out if that makes you sound like a <laughs> no. How do you do it? Ten, uh, well, Reece, literally... Do you know who I am? Yeah, no. <laughs> Going to the gym. It's like someone, how do you run a marathon? You fucking run. You practice. <laughs> no, what I mean, the decision to do a special, it's improvised. That's what I'm interested Oh no, about. it was just. Um... <laughs> Why did you do a special? <laughs> no, well, I I don't really like the term best special. But basically, basically, I don't want to do reels. I don't like putting stuff on the internet. I don't, like no offense, I, I, it doesn't make me happy. It's not me. It's not in my world. Yeah. But what I will do, which I think is better for me, and that makes my work better, yeah. is do a live show. Someone filmed it. Lovely Theo filmed it. Um, edit it. Put it online. Make it accessible. Anyone can watch it if they want. If you like it, great. If you don't like it, fine. But then it means people who can't come and travel to see me can see it. Yeah. And it also, for me, it means if it's one hour, it means you sit and you watch it. Yeah. As opposed to 40 second. Yeah. I don't, I don't like the dopamine mm. rush of... And also, I, I find memory-wise, I've seen lots of very funny clips on Instagram of comedians internationally, and I can't tell you their names. Of course. And I think that's... Mm. that's I don't if I want to know who the artist is and I think sometimes putting something out specific online mm. now I think whatever means that people have to connect in a mm. in a, diff a different way their brain maybe remembers it slightly differently or I of don't course. know but um so yeah I'm putting that out and then that means people can say hey can I watch you online and I go yeah there's one thing that is from a proper full-length show, which I have had control and agency over. Mm. Same with Next Up. Swan is on Next Up. Though I feel like it's the weakest performance of Swan that is out can there. Can you describe Swan? I, or I can, do you want me to try to describe Swan? Go on. You did Swan Lake in French without speaking French or <laughs> no one ballet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. No. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> sums it up. Yeah, that sums it up. There's ketchup involved, pants. There's lots of ketchup here, yeah. I think it's that, that. So when I heard that you did that, I was like, "That is the most inspiring thing I've ever heard." Like, fearlessness is so. It's a great show. It's yeah. a really. I'm really proud of that show. I'm going to see your show, by the way, the Stephen King show. Oh, really? 
really? Yeah, oh, yeah. King show. Oh, um, that's uh, that's a great show. That's where I got I the idea that, that you were the like the because the, I've I've had to piece all these pieces together, so I've probably made assumptions and stuff. But <laughs> that's where I thought the clowning was the because it's described as clowning, isn't it? There is clowning in it. Clowning it was more buffon actually. Buffon. That buffon and that. Buffon is like the can you describe it? That's the. The outsider, the outsider, the outsider clown. That has to come back and impress yeah. the king. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Come back and kill the king. Yeah. So that, and it's quite dark. But yeah, the <laughs> swan, which ended up getting reviewed as a clown show, which was never my intention, mm. but well, it just in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, I know it is a clown show. Um, <laughs> but the next up version and the team next up were really brilliant, or really happy with the edit. But it was just when the COVID restrictions changed. Mm. So a show that, has a lot of audience, not necessarily bring them up on stage, but lots of interaction with them. Mm. And actually at one point me climbing into the audience, which mm. is sort of where the gag is. Mm. There were 12 people in the crowd, <laughs> two of which funny. were my parents, one was an ex, <laughs> and I kid you not, the rest were lone men. And they were all <laughs> socially distanced. And it is just, and I'm gonna tell you the best, and it was during the World Cup, or like the Euros or something like that. It was during something intense. 12 people <laughs> to do a recording during a special out of all the days because the next day I had a very different audience and it was really wicked because I think the next day the legislation changed which mm. meant I could have a foolish crowd mm. <laughs> so <laughs> it is probably the most damp so I think I added a laughter track nice. <laughs> It, it, and like the first, yeah. So I watched that video and I'm like, oh God, <laughs> if I die and this is what goes down in history as the show. But I, I well, I agree with you because the reels for me is just a desperate attempt to catch up to people that have were much more focused. Yeah. So I think they are dopamine fueling, society destroying nightmares, but yeah. I don't have the body of work. Or the experience to like, like, so that's where that's my. Well, it's attempt. really smart. I mean, you don't. I don't. Yeah, like nobody has to defend why they do something. No, I feel like I do because I'm almost like. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. That sort of, some of them worked. That's like I don't deserve any of the sort of views. No, or... but you don't get to choose that. The yeah, audience that's true. decide that. That's true. The audience decide if you deserve it, and if they buy the tickets and they book it and they follow you, then you deserved it. Doesn't you know? That's what the free market is. Yeah. That's Economics. What, that's what competition is. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Someone's like, oh, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. I just, I just think I'll, I'll. Well, I'm the big supporter for comedy in general because. And there's different types. Yeah. There's Which different types really, of artists. You, yeah. Like even the play, like blew my mind. I was like, I didn't know this is an option. Similar thing, and this, I don't know if this is insulting or praise. A book of Mormon also opened my eyes in a similar way. Different venue, obviously different avenue, more convert what. But it's incredible. Yeah, it was. The, the South Park writer is phenomenal. Yeah. Really brilliant. So it's just like little things opening. So I'm just like, everyone should go for it. Yeah, it's there's fine. loads of different ways you can do what you want to do. Mm. Just got to take risks, fail, work out what makes you happy. Sounds oh. very simplified. Obviously, there's so a huge succinct. amount of. <laughs> I mean, saying that, last night I was in tears. <laughs> I was like crying to my partner, being like, I've not, I'm not working hard enough. And he was like, right, what are your problems? And I was like, very about But how do you, you have so much work, so much output? Yeah. But how? Like, I mean, that's the thing. Teach yourself how. I, I think, I don't know, it's like hyper. But then, so, like, I, but then at the same time, like, I work very hard, mm. but then do I work the most. Because it's like the argument, it's so, it's so funny, like I'll get into a conversation, someone's like, have you been on telly? Or, you know, I don't earn half as much as some of my colleagues in comedy do because they do corporates and mm -hmm. they do this and, you know, and their work is more, perhaps more mainstream in that they are able to appeal to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Like I can do mainstream comedy, I know I can, but I haven't done, you know. I, and also my some of my friends have made the choice to do the reels, so they've got how much more thousands of followers that I have and or they've made choices and made risks that have really paid off. So it it again it's that funny thing about meaning because I look at my career and I've made a huge amount of work. Does it financially show in my bank account? Not necessarily. Am I able to buy a house? Absolutely not. Like can I afford my wedding? No. <laughs> but, like, no, I'm very much like in an artist's sort of mm. realm. But at the same time I'm like I look at the body of work, mm. 
And I think that's that is cool. Like yeah, I am really proud dope. of I am really proud of that work. And it's mm. like, do you want to be so it's do you want to be famous or do you want to be respected? Was my, what my dad said to me. And he says it's not that, that they can't be the same, mm. but sometimes they do require different they do require different paths. And I was like, well, I'd quite like to whilst I'm still working out who I am. Mm. I think I don't know. Like, I'm ready for your dad to start a cult. By the way, if he wants a member, well, not I'm fully <laughs> in. There you go. There's your. There's for the. There's the Patreon for the for the Elfonomics. People should listen to Elfonomics. And go, we just need you to kill one child. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Um, but I'll, yeah. I'll try to take it back to the comedy. You just got such creative stories to talk about. But like, how did you go from open mic to professional comic? Then what was the sort of change that happened? Was it just gigs? I think the smartest thing I. I mean, and again, also, it was, I think you can't underestimate how important it is when you've got family that support you. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that financially. I mean that as in actually a family who believe that you're capable. Because mm -hmm. I think the fact that my mum and dad made the effort to come and see me and come and see shows that I was terrible in. Mm -hmm. And who, like, I remember doing the gong show and I had the an audience member threaten to rape me. I remember, and it was, and a few days later, I did a comedy gig and my parents were like, Emily, it's like you've been in a fox hunt. They were like, you, it's like you've been a, you seem like prey. That's how you act at the moment. You see it, because I was so shell-shocked by that behavior. Um, but my pa my mum said to me, she was like, you don't need to do that. You do not need to do that gig. Anything that creates that impact and that level of stress is not worth it at all. And I think that was really useful. Like, And so going, right, I can't, I didn't do good in competitions. I've never been good in competitions. I was terrible in my 11 plus. <laughs> just, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's once to get into secondary school. It was part of the reason I, like, you know, ended up going to the boarding school. Not mm. like any school. I like, just couldn't do the entrance test. Mm. Totally dyslexic. Really stressed really bullied like you know I was a weirdo like and then I went you know and I found a school where the drama teacher was really kind to me and I went oh it's nice here <laughs> <laughs> of course it was nice it looked like Harry Potter <laughs> my parents, but I didn't, I didn't understand finances as a kid my parents were like do you really want to go there and I was like yes and they're like oh fuck, fuck. so yeah but they were like she's happy for the first time and she's not pretending to be dead mm. um so you know um but what was I talking about uh but I think I, I never did well in competitions. There was this desire to prove, especially in five minutes, which I always found hard. So I was like, right, I can pay, you could pay an entrance fee to a show like the Camden Fringe. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how much it was. And I can do an hour for two nights. Mm -hmm. I could get all my friends in. I could make the money back. But then I've got two nights where I'm on stage for an hour. And that's the equivalent of, how many gigs in a week? How many five minute spots in a week? You know, that's not the right way to measure it, but in terms of five minutes. Um, I was like, okay, I can do that. That's really good. So that was how I did it. I started going, I will do one hour. I'll do 40 minute whips. So I used mm. to do whips in pubs at different places, mm. which actually made me more money. It was a more financially smarter call. I think. I think it's just better overall. It's better overall and I became better. And also, you know, I didn't charge expensive prices at the beginning. It was really cheap, which meant people didn't mind that it was a bit rough around the edges. People knew what they were investing in. And that's it. If it's a whip, you charge low. You always, you know, and if you're charging more than 10 quid, it better be good. Better be a show. You don't, you don't rip your audience off, especially... Like people pay for babysitters, people commute. Like, come on, no, you're understand that time is really valuable. <laughs> so, how do you keep that time is valuable, but then do a whip? Like, how do you go in? How do you approach the rip the whip? Because obviously, it's going to be rough. Yeah, but you just it's about being honest. Obviously, mm. charge low, but charge. Um, Did you have a plan for the show? Sorry, I'm just interested because I would love that. I think that makes so much sense to go and like put on your own production. So the way I would always say now to people, especially like get a group of other artists that you get on with comedians hire a rehearsal space which is actually cheaper mm. than a venue hire and do it like the way a theater r d does it from two to five you've got three hours write for a little bit dance in front of the mirror show your work to each other perform it practice it like it's a theater play and then invite some mates in at four o'clock and do an hour do a whip in front of them and do an r d 
perform what you've got, give a 15 minute break, and then people give their feedback. The friends that have come yeah. and watched it. That's so um, good. That's what I did for Raven because I just couldn't, because I was teaching full time. I didn't have the energy mm. or the capacity to do previews. Mm. So I hired rehearsal space and I would invite one or two friends in at a time. Mm. Leslie, who helps run Troy Club, was absolutely phenomenal. My friend Sarah, um, who's brilliant. Like, you know, my friend David Hoskin is a mime who's lovely. Like, people, friends came in and would give me an hour of their time to That's watch nice. me. Lit and people actually, are, I think, far more willing with, to do that because it's that teamwork helping build up. Josh Glance, Damian Warren, um, Damian Warren Smith, who's like, Damien Warren Smith and Josh Glantz are like two of them, my most precious, mm. like adore them, brilliant artists. But they really, because with Raven, I wasn't ready. I was mm. really last year, I was really depressed. Like I was in teaching, I was in so much stress about Edinburgh. There was all this pressure because I'd been out of the mix, you know, after COVID, I trained as a teacher. I felt like I wasn't really known anymore. I felt like this was my last chance to prove that I was still around or well, that was how I was made to feel to a certain extent. Mm. And so there was all this unnecessary pressure to make a fantastic show mm. and the show wasn't ready like the show was not ready until the day before mm. and then i went we had this idea to do with vegetables and then suddenly the show Clicked. just fell into place and then it and it developed and then by the end of the month i had a show that i just adored mm. and the audience really adored it as well that came to see the show and it that became yeah and that felt really magical mm. Well, well done. I think it's really important for people when you make shows, you make it, it's got to be something that you're in love with. It's a mm. show that you love and you have to be so proud of it afterwards. I think that's really important with your work. Mm. You have to love your work because it's the only, it's what carries you. Mm. Like when you get to a venue and you've only got 10 people in, you've got to be like, I love this show. Mm. I think that's the advice I have. That's very good. Um, that was like, I just make so much sense. Everything you're saying is just clicking. Um, <laughs> but how do you solicit like good feedback? Like mm -hmm. when you when you run the research and development, like how, how does feedback work? Because feedback's quite touchy for a lot of people, especially in stand up. Mm. Is there like, is it just everyone just respects each other? Is that the important part or is that a dumb question? I don't know. I think it's like, you know, when. Obviously, if it's just one random thing. Also, watching how everyone also reacts to the feedback being mm. given. If everyone goes, what? You can be like, oh, that's a bit of a yeah. curve. Um, um, I don't know. Um, I also find if, a, if, a, if some feedback really t hits a nerve, mm. that can be sometimes a sign that it's important to write down and reflect on. Because mm. why did it touch a nerve? Yeah, why am I getting upset? Yeah, <laughs> why why laughing? What's happening? Um, but then also, I would assume you'd invite people that you trust and respect. You're not yeah. don't invite people that you want to impress. Yeah, that's not the right person. Yeah, you invite people who you who you trust and like, whose work you like. Mm. No point in inviting someone whose work you don't like. Mm. Don't just invite someone who you know just, just right. to get numbers. <laughs> just to get numbers up. It's not going to be a views. Facebook group. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like there's some people I know with the greatest respect who will watch my work time and time again and will just be like this. <laughs> <laughs> I find that impossible because you're having so much fun. Because uh, I know it's, uh, well, it looks like you're having fun. Maybe you're not. Yeah. Maybe inside you're like, this is the worst night of my entire life. But uh, I thought you were having so much fun. But with stand-up, do you think that still works as well? Because stand-up traditionally isn't that fun. It's more like, uh, again, oh, I'm it should the be fun. Do you think so? Of well, course you should. Yeah, that's do you not fun. have fun doing it? No, I do. Sorry, that was dumb. But I mean, sometimes I feel like for five or ten minutes, I has to be really like, I say this, then I say this. No. No? No, it doesn't have to be like that at all. Okay. No. What makes you happy? Yeah, I suppose it's the weird competitions that force that sort of mindset. No, no, it's no good. It's already a competition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, like as much as you know, that's why the communities and your friendships and the in the industry are so important mm -hmm. because we can't lie from each other that it is. Mm -hmm. There's only so many people who can be on that bill. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Yeah, like it's horrible, but that's like. <laughs> I don't think it's horrible. I think it makes sense. So yeah, if you're trying to choreograph yourself for someone else, you're never going to be happy. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Very wise, Elf, very wise. Oh my god, I think I sound like a tosser. No, not at all. It's, well, Elf, thank you for coming. What have we got next? We've got the special coming out. We so, don't want to call it special, but we don't want yeah, it special. I've got Talks Dirty coming out on my YouTube channel, which will be free to watch so anyone can subscribe, mm. Elf Lions. Um, if you were one of my students from school, please don't comment saying, <laughs> oh my goodness, this is my old drama teacher, because I will just send it to the head of department and we can work out which laptop it's coming from on the school so oh, sorry this is serious sorry I was though, laughing. Though, but it's true so oh, the amount of students who were like oh my goodness and i'm like you do know we can find out who this is mm. like it's not <laughs> you're not an mi5 yeah um so i'm doing that I'm, I'm then doing raven on the 16th of june at leicester square theater mm. there's some tickets still left it'd be lovely to sell that out and then there's Elfonomics, which is my comedy economics podcast with my dad, where we will slowly get you to join a cult. <laughs> and member then, number one's already signed up. I don't know. You might have existing cult members, in which yeah. case I will compete with them <laughs> for your father's affection. Oh, my good. Yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> and then after Raven on the 16th of June at mm. Leicester Square Theatre, it's um, Duffy and I are doing our show at the Edinburgh Festival for two weeks, mm. and it's our BSL VV Mime, clown, extravaganza, heist, which is accessible for the deaf, hard of hearing, um, uh, blind. It's like is accessible. Mm. We're trying to make it as accessible as possible. I'm not sure if the f venue is wheelchair accessible, but it will perform in venues which are wheelchair accessible after Edinburgh. That's very nice. So we're doing that for two weeks at Monkey Barrel. I will go to that as well. I'm going up to Edinburgh. Yay! Yeah, so I will we'll just hang say out. That. Um, one thing, I'll cut. It, I'll have to rework it a little bit. Yeah. Can we do an Elf's Edinburgh Survival Guide, and then I will leave you from this. Yeah, would that be um, cool? Elf's Edinburgh Survival <laughs> Guide. <laughs> Elf's Edinburgh Survival Guide. Um, see as much. Uh, try and see one show from every venue, so all the different types of venues. Because there's no such thing as one venue better than the other in terms of some people like look mm. down in some venues. Don't go and see, go and see one from every venue. Um, go and see someone that flies you passionately. Go and take your time to see someone's show. And don't say that you will see, don't promise to see someone's show and then not see it. Mm. Because people are sensitive and remember promises. So if you can't make a I show, regret just, that, I promise you, not yeah. enough. <laughs> no, just joke, saying, I'll be there. So just saying, someone, <laughs> yeah, just saying, I will try. I can't promise anything, but I will try. That's very nice. Um, and from the performers, how do you think the performers should survive? From the performers? I mean, that was for the performers as well. Oh, okay, you only get nice. good by seeing other stuff as mm. well. And um, I'm not going to say don't read reviews because I read reviews. They can be quite fun. Um, but I would definitely... What would I say? Make as many. Don't don't get don't get bitter. Don't be. Bitter. <laughs> That's don't, good advice. Don't be so don't many be a, bitter people. Don't be a bitter Bertie. <laughs> be a happy Horace. You're yeah, at the biggest arts festival in the world, and also it's meant to be hard. Let's grow up. I was gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been described as gangster before. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you very much for coming, Elf. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. Also, everyone, please follow Elf and go to all her shows. They're uh, the one I've seen so far, greatest play of my entire life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the review. <laughs> thank uh, you. If you've enjoyed it, uh, give it a five star on Apple Podcast or Spotify. And if you see any sort of reels or anything, give them a share. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, Elf. Bye. Thank you.